Section 37 of Passages from the Life of a Philosopher. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Jones in Bonita Springs, Florida. Section 37 The Author's Further Contributions to Human Knowledge, Part 2. Experiments in America. The letter which was sent to the United States was placed in the hands of the Coast Survey. The plan was highly approved, and Congress made a grant of $5,000 in order to try it experimentally. After a long series of experiments, in which its merits were severely tested, a report was made to Congress strongly recommending its adoption. I then received a very pressing invitation to visit the United States for the purpose of assisting to put it in action. It was conveyed to me by an amiable and highly cultivated person, the late Mr. Reed, professor of English literature at Philadelphia, who, on his arrival in London, proposed that I should accompany him on his return in October, the best season for the voyage, and in the finest vessel of their mercantile navy. I had long had a great wish to visit the American continent, but I did not think it worth crossing the Atlantic unless I could have spent a twelfth month in America. Finding this impossible under the then circumstances, about a month before the time arrived, I resigned with great reluctance to the pleasure of accompanying my friend to his own country. The Author's Escape It was most fortunate that I was thus prevented from embarking on board the Arctic, a steamer of the largest class, steaming at the rate of thirteen knots an hour over the banks of Newfoundland, during a dense fog, the Arctic was run into by a steamer of about half its size, moving at the rate of seven knots. The concussion was in this circumstance fatal to the larger vessel. This sad catastrophe was thus described by the brother of my lost friend. Quote, on the 20th of September, 1854, Mr. Reed, with his sister, embarked at Liverpool for New York in the United States steamship Arctic. Seven days afterward, at noon, on the 27th, when almost in sight of his native land, a fatal collision occurred, and before sundown every human being left upon the ship had sunk under the waves of the ocean. The only survivor who personally acquainted with my brother saw him about two o'clock p.m. after the collision, and not very long before the ship sank, sitting with his sister in the small passage aft of the dining room. They were tranquil and silent, though their faces wore the look of painful anxiety. They probably afterwards left this position and repaired to the promenade deck for a selfish struggle for life with a helpless companion dependent upon him, with a physical frame unsuited for such a strife, and above all with a sentiment of religious resignation which taught him in that hour of agony, even with the memory of his wife and children thronging in his mind, to bow his head in submission to the will of God. For such a struggle he was wholly unsuited, and his is the praise that he perished with the women and children." Close quote occulting light at brussels in eighteen fifty three i spent some weeks at brussels during my residence in that city a congress of naval officers from all the maritime nations assembled to discuss and agree upon certain rules and observations to be arranged for the common benefit of all one evening i had the great pleasure of receiving the whole party at my house for the purpose of witnessing my occulting lights the portable occulting light which I had brought with me was placed in the veranda on the first floor, and then we went along the boulevards to see its effect at different distances and with various numerical symbols. On our return, several papers relating to this subject were lying upon the table. The Russian representative, Mr. Blank, took up one of the original printed descriptions and was much interested in it. On taking leave, he asked with some hesitation whether I would lend it to him for a few hours. I told him at once that if I possessed another copy, I would willingly give it to him. But that not being the case, I could only offer to lend it. M. Blank therefore took it home with him, and when I sat down to breakfast the next morning, I found it upon my table. 
In the course of the day I met my Russian friend in the park. I expressed my hope that he had been interested by the little tract he had so speedily returned. He replied that it had interested him so much that he had sat up all night and copied the whole of it, and that his transcript and dispatch upon the subject was now on its way by the post to his own government. Several years after I was informed that occulting solar lights were used by the Russians during the siege of Sebastopol. Night Signals The system of occulting lights applies with remarkable facility to night signals, either on shore or at sea. If it is used numerically, it applies to all the great dictionaries of the various maritime nations. I may here remark that there exist means by which all such signals may, if necessary, be communicated in cipher. Sun Signals The distance at which such signals can be rendered visible exceeds that of any other class of signals by means of light. During the Irish trigonometrical survey, a mountain in Scotland was observed with an angular instrument from a field in Ireland at the distance of 108 miles. This was accomplished by stationing a party on the summit of the mountain in Scotland with a looking-glass of about a foot square directing the sun's image to the opposite station. No occultations were used, but if the mirror had been larger and occultation employed, the messages might have been sent and the time of residence upon the mountain considerably diminished. When I was occupied with occulting signals, I made this widely known. I afterwards communicated the plan, during a visit to Paris, to many of my friends in that capital, and by request to the Minister of Marine. I have observed in the Comte Rendu that the system has to a certain extent been since used in the south of Algeria, where, during eight months of the year, the sun is generally unobscured by clouds as long as it is above the horizon. I have not, however, noticed in those communications to the Institute any reference to my own previous publication. Zenith Light Signals Another form of signal, although not capable of use at very great distances, may, however, be employed with considerable advantage under certain circumstances. Universality and economy are its great advantages. It consists of a looking-glass, making an angle of 45 degrees with the horizon, placed just behind an opening in a vertical board, this being stuck into the earth, the light of the sky in the zenith, which is usually the brightest, will be projected horizontally through the opening in whatever direction the person to be communicated with may be placed. The person who makes the signals must stand on one side in front of the instrument, and by passing his hat slowly before the aperture any number of times, may thus express each unit's figure of his signal. He must then, leaving the light visible, pause while he deliberately counts to himself ten. He must then, with his hat, make a number of occultations equal to the tens figure he wishes to express. This must be continued for each figure in the number of the signal, always pausing between each during the time of counting ten. When the end of the signal is terminated, he must count sixty in the same manner, and if the signal he gave has not been acknowledged, he should repeat it until it has been observed. The same simple telegraph may be used in a dark night by substituting a lantern for the looking-glass. The whole apparatus is simple and cheap, and can be easily carried even by a small boy. I was led to this contrivance many years ago by reading an account of a vessel stranded within thirty yards of the shore. Its crew consisted of thirteen people, ten of whom got into the boat, leaving the master, who thought himself safer in the ship, with two others of the crew. The boat put off from the ship, keeping as much out of the breakers as it could, and looking out for a favorable place for landing. The people on shore followed the boat for several miles, urging them not to attempt landing. But not a single word was audible by the boat's crew, who, after rowing several miles, resolved to take advantage of the first favorable lull. They did so. The boat was knocked to pieces, and the whole crew were drowned. If the people on the shore could at that moment have communicated with the boat's crew, 
they could have informed them that, by continuing their course for half a mile further, they might turn into a cove and land almost dry. I was much impressed by the want of easy communication between stranded vessels and those on shore who might rescue them. Shipwreck Signals I can even now scarcely believe it credible that the very simple means I am about to mention has not been adopted years ago. A list of about a hundred questions relating to directions and inquiries required to be communicated between the crew of a stranded ship and those on shore who wish to aid it would, I am told, be amply sufficient for such purposes. Now, if such a list of inquiries were prepared and printed by competent authority, any system of signals by which a number of two places of figures can be expressed might be used. This list of inquiries and answers ought to be printed on cards and nailed up on several parts of every vessel. It would be still better, by conference with other maritime nations, to adopt the same system of signs and to have them printed in each language. A looking-glass, a board with a hole in it, and a lantern would be all the apparatus required. The lantern might be used for night, and the looking-glass for day signals. These simple and inexpensive signals might be occasionally found useful for various social purposes. Short Distance Signals Two neighbors in the country whose houses, though reciprocally visible, are separated by an interval of several miles, might occasionally telegraph to each other. If the looking-glass were of large size, its light and its occultation might be seen perhaps from six to ten miles, and thus become by daylight a cheap guiding light through the channels and into harbors. It may also become a question whether it might not in some cases save the expense of buoying certain channels. For railway signals during the daylight, it might in some cases be of great advantage by saving the erection of very lofty poles carrying dark frames through which the light of the sky is admitted. Amongst my early experiments I made an occulting hand lantern with a shade for occulting by the pressure of the thumb and with two other shades of red and green glass. This might be made available for military purposes or for the police. Greenwich Time Signals it has been thought very desirable that a signal to indicate Greenwich time should be placed on the start point, the last spot with ships going down the channel on distant voyages usually sight. The advantage of such an arrangement arises from this, that chronometers, having had their rates ascertained on shore, may have them somewhat altered by the motions to which they are submitted at sea. If, therefore, after a run of above two hundred miles, they can be informed of the exact Greenwich time, the sea rate of their chronometers will be obtained. Of course, no other difficulty than that of expense occurs in transmitting Greenwich time by electricity to any points on our coast. The real difficulty is to convey it to the passing vessels. The firing of a cannon at certain fixed hours has been proposed, but this plan is encumbered by requiring the knowledge of the distance of the vessel from the gun, and also from the variation of the velocity of the transmission of sound under various circumstances. During the night, the flash arising from ignited gunpowder might be employed, but this, in the case of rain or other atmospheric circumstances, might be impeded. The best plan for night signals would be to have an occulting light which might be that of the lighthouse itself, or other specially reserved for the purpose. During the day, and when the sun is shining, the time might be transmitted by the occultations of reflected solar light, which would be seen at any distance the curvature of the earth admitted. The application of my zenith light might perhaps fulfill all the required conditions during daylight. I have found that, even in the atmosphere of London, an opening only five inches square can be distinctly seen and its occultations counted by the naked eye at the distance of a quarter mile. If the side of the opening were double the former, then the light transmitted to the eye would be four times as great and the occultations might be observed at the distance of one mile. The looking glass employed must have its side nearly in the proportion of three to two. 
so that one of five feet by seven and a half ought to be seen at the distance of about eight or nine miles. Geological Theory of Isothermal Surfaces During one portion of my resident at Naples, my attention was concentrated upon what, in my opinion, is the most remarkable building upon the face of the earth, the Temple of Serapis at Puzzuoli. In this inquiry, I profited from the assistance of Mr. Head, now the Right Honorable Sir Edmund Head, Bart, K.C.B., late Governor-General of Canada. An abstract of my own observations was printed in the Abstracts of Proceedings of the Geological Society, Volume 2, page 72. My friend's historical views were printed in the Transactions of the Antiquarian Society. Temple of Serapis it was obviously built at or above the level of the Mediterranean in order to profit by a hot spring which supplied its numerous baths. There is unmistakable evidence that it has subsided below the present level of the sea at least twenty-five feet, that it must have remained there during many years, that it then rose gradually up probably to its former level, and that during the last twenty years it has been again slowly subsiding. The results of this survey led me in the following year to explain the various elevations and depressions on portions of the earth's surface at different periods of time, by a theory which I have called the theory of the earth's isothermal surfaces. I do not think the importance of that theory has been well understood by geologists who are not always sufficiently acquainted with physical science. The late Sir Henry de la Beche perceived at an early period the great light of those sciences might throw upon his own favorite pursuit, and was himself always anxious to bring them to bear upon geology. I am still more confirmed in my opinion of the importance of the theory of isothermal surfaces in geology, from the fact that a few years afterwards my friend Sir John Herschel arrived independently at precisely the same theory. I have stated this at length in the notes to the Ninth Bridgewater Treatise. Games of Skill A considerable time after the translation of Menabrea's memoir had been published, and after I had made many drawings of the analytical engine and all its parts, I began to meditate upon the intellectual means by which I had reached to such an advanced and even to such unexpected results. I reviewed in my mind the various principles which I had touched upon in my published and unpublished papers, and dwelt with satisfaction upon the power which I possessed over the mechanism through the aid of the mechanical notation. I felt, however, that it would be more satisfactory to the minds of others, and even in some measure to my own, that I should try the power of such principles as I had laid down by assuming some question of an entirely new kind and endeavoring to solve it by the aid of those principles which had so successfully guided me in other cases. Games of skill can be played by an automaton. After much consideration, I selected for my test the contrivance of a machine that should be able to play a game of purely intellectual skill, successfully, such as tit-tat-toe, draughts, chess, etc., I endeavored to ascertain the opinions of persons in every class of life, and of all ages, whether they thought it required human reason to play games of skill. The most constant answer was in the affirmative. Some supported this view of the case by observing that, if it were otherwise, then an automaton could play such games. A few of those who had considerable acquaintance with mathematical science allowed the possibility of machinery being capable of such work, but they most stoutly deny the possibility of contriving such machinery on account of the myriads of combinations which even the simplest games included. On the first part of my inquiry, I soon arrived at a demonstration that every game of skill is susceptible of being played by an automaton. Further consideration showed that if any position of the men upon the board were assumed, whether that position were possible or impossible, then if the automaton could make the first move rightly, he must be able to win the game. Always supposing that, 
under the given position of the men, that conclusion were possible. Whatever move the automaton made, another move would be made by his adversary. Now this altered state of the board is one amongst the many positions of the men in which, by the previous paragraph, the automaton was supposed capable of acting. Hence the question is reduced to that of making the best move under any possible combinations of positions of the men. Now several questions the automaton has to consider are of this nature. 1. Is the position of the men, as placed before him on the board, a possible position, that is, one which is consistent with the rules of the game? 2. If so, has automaton himself already lost the game? 3. If not, then has automaton won the game? 4. If not, can he win it at the next move? If so, make that move. 5. If not, could his adversary, if he had the move, win the game? If so, automaton must prevent him, if possible. 7. If his adversary cannot win the game at his next move, automaton must examine whether he can make such a move that, if he were allowed to have two moves in succession, he could at the second move have two different ways of winning the game. And each of these cases failing, automaton must look forward to three or more successive moves. Now I have already stated that in the analytical engine I had devised mechanical means equivalent to memory, also that I had provided other means equivalent to foresight, and that the engine itself could act upon this foresight. Number of the Combinations In consequence of this, the whole question of making an automaton play any game depended upon the possibility of the machine being able to represent all the myriads of combinations relating to it. Allowing 100 moves on each side for the longest game of chess, I found that the combinations involved in the analytical engine enormously surpassed any required even by the game of chess. Game of Tit-Tat-Toe as soon as I had arrived at this conclusion, I commenced an examination of a game called tit-tat-toe, usually played by little children. It is the simplest game with which I am acquainted. Each player has five counters, one set marked with a plus, the other with a zero. The board consists of a square divided into nine smaller squares, and the object of each player is to get three of his own men in a straight line. One man is put on the board by each player alternately. In practice, no board is used, but the children draw upon a bit of paper or on their slate a figure likely any of the following. The successive moves of the two players may be represented as follow. And here a diagram is presented. In this case, plus wins at the seventh move. The next step I made was to ascertain what number of combinations were required for all the possible variety of moves and situations. I found this to be comparatively insignificant. I therefore easily sketched out mechanism by which such an automaton might be guided. Hitherto I had considered only a philosophical view of this subject, but a new idea now entered my head which seemed to offer some chance of enabling me to acquire the funds necessary to complete the analytical engine. It occurred to me that if an automaton were made to play this game, it might be surrounded with such attractive circumstances that a very popular and profitable exhibition might be produced. I imagined that the machine might consist of the figures of two children playing against each other, accompanied by a lamb and a cock, that the child who won the game might clap his hands whilst the cock was crowing, that the child who was beaten might cry and wring his hands whilst the lamb began bleating. I then proceeded to sketch various mechanical means by which every action could be produced. These, when compared with those I had employed for the analytical engine, were remarkably simple. A difficulty, however, arose of a novel kind. It will have been observed in the explanation I gave of the analytical engine that cases arose in which it became necessary, on the occurrence of certain conditions, that the machine itself should select one out of two or more distinct modes of calculation. 
the particular one to be adopted could only be known when those calculations on which the selection depended had been already made. Difficulty arising from choice. The new difficulty consisted in this, that when the automaton had to move, it might occur that there were two different moves, each equally conducive to his winning the game. In this case, no reason existed within the machine to direct his choice, unless also some provision were made that the machine could attempt two contradictory motions. The first remedy I devised for this defect was to make the machine keep a record of the number of games it had won from the commencement of its existence. Whenever two moves, which we may call A and B, were equally conducive to winning the game, the automaton was made to consult the record of the number of games it had won. If that number happened to be even, he was directed to take the course A. If it were odd, he was to take course B. If there were three moves equally possible, the automaton was directed to divide the number of games he had won by three. In this case, the numbers 0, 1, or 2 might be the remainder, and the machine was directed to take the course A, B, or C accordingly. It is obvious that any number of conditions might be thus provided for. An inquiring spectator who observed the games played by the automaton might watch a long time before he discovered the principle upon which it acted. It is also worthy of remark how admirably this illustrates the best definitions of chance by the philosopher and the poet. Quote, chance is but the expression of man's ignorance. Laplace. All chance, design, ill understood. Pope. Close quote. Exhibition of automaton. Having fully satisfied myself of the power of making such an automaton, the next step was to ascertain whether there was any probability, if it were exhibited to the public, of its producing in a moderate time such a sum of money as would enable me to construct the analytical engine. A friend to whom I had at an early period communicated the idea entertained great hopes of its pecuniary success. When it became known that an automaton could beat not merely children but even papa and mamma at a child's game, it seemed not unreasonable to expect that every child who heard of it would ask mamma to see it. On the other hand, every mamma and some few papas who heard of it would doubtless take their children to so singular and interesting a sight. I resolved, on my return to London, to make inquiries as to the relative productiveness of the various exhibitions of recent years, and also to obtain some rough estimate of the probable time it would take to construct the automaton, as well as some approximation to the expense. It occurred to me that if half a dozen were made, they might be exhibited in three different places at the same time. Each exhibitor might then have an automaton in reserve in case of accidental injury. On my return to town, I made the inquiries I had alluded to, and found that the English machine for making Latin verses, the German talking machine, as well as several others, were entire failures in a pecuniary point of view. I also found that the most profitable exhibition, which had occurred for many years, was that of the little dwarf General Tom Thumb. On considering the whole question, I arrived at the conclusion that to conduct the affair to a successful issue, it would occupy so much of my own time to contrive and execute the machinery, and then to superintend the working out of the plan, that even if successful in point of pecuniary profit, it would be too late to avail myself of the money thus acquired to complete the analytical engine. Problem of the Three Magnetic Bodies the problem of the three magnetic bodies, which has caused such unwearied labor to so many of the highest intellects of this and the past age, is simple compared with another which is opening upon us. We now possess a very extensive series of well-recorded observations of the positions of the magnetic needle in various parts of our globe during about thirty years. Causes of Magnetic Changes Certain periods of changes of about 10 or 11 years are said to be indicated as connected with changes in the amount of solar spots. But the inductive evidence scarcely rests upon three periods, and it seems more probable that these effects arise from some common cause. 1. 
it has been long known that the earth has at least two, if not more, magnetic poles. Two, it is probable, therefore, that the sun and moon also have several magnetic poles. Three, in 1826, I proved that when a magnet is brought into proximity to a piece of matter capable of becoming magnetic, the magnetism communicated by it requires time for its full development in the body magnetized. Also that when the influence of the magnet is removed, the magnetized body requires time to regain its former state. This being the case, it is required, having assumed certain positions for the poles of these various magnetic bodies, to calculate the reciprocal influences in changing the positions of those poles on other bodies. The development of the equations representing these forces will indicate cycles which really belong to the nature of the subject. The comparisons of a long series of observations with recorded facts will ultimately enable us to determine both the number and position of those poles upon each body. Electric Changes Electricity possesses an analogous property with respect to time being required for its full action. If the bodies of our system influence each other electrically, other developments will be required and other cycles discovered. When the equations resulting from the actions of these causes are formed, and means of developing them are arranged, the whole of the rest of the work becomes under the domain of machinery. End of section 37. The author's further contributions to human knowledge, part 2. Section 38 of Passages from the Life of a Philosopher. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Thomas Trask, near Tucson, Arizona. Passages from the Life of a Philosopher by Charles Babbage. Section 38. Results of Science. Chapter 35. Results of Science. At the commencement of life I had hoped that, whilst I indulged in the pursuits of science, I might derive from it some advantages for my family, or at least that it might enable me to replace a small portion of the large expenditure, without which one of my most important discoveries could not be practically worked out. I shall now mention briefly several of those appointments for which I had the vanity to suppose myself qualified, and the simplicity to believe that fitness for the office was of the slightest use without interest to get the appointment. 1. In the early part of 1816, the professorship of mathematics at the East India College in Halleyborough became vacant. The salary, I believe, was £500 a year. I became a candidate and had strong recommendations from Ivory and Playfair. I was informed that it was usual for candidates to call on the directors. I did so. One of them was an honest man, for he was kind enough to tell me the truth. He said, If you have interest, you will get it. If not, you will not succeed. 2. In 1819, the professorship of mathematics at Edinburgh became vacant by the death of Playfair and the succession of Professor Leslie to his chair. I immediately became a candidate and received testimony of my fitness from LaCroix, Boyd, and Laplace. These communications, though gratifying to myself, were useless for the object. Not being a Scot, I was rejected at Edinburgh. That visit, however, led to a very agreeable incident. I spent a delightful week in Canal with Dougal Stewart. The second volume of his Philosophy of the Human Mind had fortunately fallen into my hands at an earlier period during my residence at Cambridge and I had derived much instruction from that valuable work. Board of Longitude 3. About this time, in a conversation with Sir Joseph Banks, I mentioned my wish to have a seat at the Board of Longitude, an office to which a salary of £100 a year was attached. Although not then appointed, hopes were held out by Sir Joseph that at some future occasion I might be more successful. In 1820, another vacancy occurred in the Board of Longitude, I called on Sir Joseph Banks to ask his influence with the Admiralty. This he declined, alleging as a reason for withholding it the part I had taken in the institution of the Astronomical Society. 
I was one of its founders and had been one of its first honorary secretaries, and had taken an active part in that committee by which the nautical almanac was remodeled. 4. In 1824, an opportunity unexpectedly presented itself. I was invited to take the entire organization and management of an office for the Assurance of Lives, then about to be established. It is sufficient to state that amongst our officers were the late Marquess of Lansdowne and the late Lord Abercrombie, the present Master of the Rolls, and the present Judge of the Admiralty Court, and that our direction included some of the first merchants in the city two or three directors of the Bank of England, and about an equal number of India directors. Life Assurance Office The proposition made to me was that I should have the entire management of the concern as director and actuary, with a salary of £1,500 a year, and an apartment in the establishment with liberty to practice as an actuary. On consulting my friend, the late Francis Bailey, FRS, who had himself practiced as an actuary, he strongly advised me to accept the office. He assured me that the profit arising from private practice could scarcely be less than £1,000 a year, and would probably be much more. Under these circumstances, I accepted the proposition. On examining the materials which existed for a table for the values of lives, I found in one of the addresses for Mr. Morgan, the actuary of the equitable, materials with which to construct, by the aid of various calculations, a very tolerable table of the actual mortality in that society. Upon this basis, I calculated the tables of our new institution. After three months' labor, when the whole of the arrangement had been completed, and the day of our opening had been fixed, circumstances occurred which induced us to give up the plan. After the experience I had now had of the amount of time occupied by such an office, I was unwilling to renew the engagement with other parties. I hoped by great exertions to complete the difference engine after the lapse of a few years, and that I should not be allowed to become a serious loser by that course. The institution was therefore given up, and we each contributed about 100 pounds to discharge the expenses incurred. Within the subsequent 12 months, an application to take the management of another life assurance society was made to me, which I declined. That office is still in existence. The information and experience I had thus gained led me to think that the public were not sufficiently informed respecting the nature of assurances on lives, and that a small, popular work on the subject might be useful. I prepared such a work, as intervals of leisure admitted, and early in 1826 published it under the title A Comparative View of the Various Institutions of the Assurance of Lives. This little volume was soon translated into German and became the groundwork upon which the Great Life Assurance Society of Gotha was founded. Every year since that event, I have received a copy of the report of the State of the Institution, a gratifying attention which I am happy to have this opportunity of acknowledging. The wish expressed by my translator in his preface has always been fulfilled by the establishment of many other excellent life assurance offices founded on similar principles. Footnote 64. May this book soon give rise to many flourishing life assurance companies in our beloved fatherland, by which proportionate wealth and happiness may be promoted amongst us, and at the same time prepare for the decline of lotteries. German translation of Babbage on life assurance. German assurance companies. In Germany alone there were, in 1860, 24 life assurance companies, in which about 260,000 persons were assured to the amount of upwards of 40 million sterling. The oldest and most successful of these institutions have adopted my table of the equitable experience, and I am informed that it agrees very well with the results of their own experiences up to about the 57th year. After this, the deaths are rather more frequent than those of the equitable. Another, still more gratifying result arose. My father, whose acquaintance with mercantile affairs was very extensive, was so pleased with the little book that, during the last two years of his life, he read it through three times. Mastership of the Mint 5. In 1846, the Mastership of the Mint became vacant. In former days, it was held by Newton. I had pointed it out in The Decline of Science as one of those offices to which men of science might reasonably aspire. A complete acquaintance 
with the most advanced state of mechanical science, which the demands of my own machinery had compelled me to improve, added to a knowledge of the internal economies of manufactories, appeared to me to constitute fair claims on that office. In the event of my succeeding, I had proposed to let the whole of my salaries accumulate, so that at the end of ten or twelve years I might retire from the office and be enabled with twenty thousand pounds thus earned to construct the analytical engine. I wrote to Lord Melbourne on the subject, but I did not mention that circumstance even to my most intimate friends. It came, however, to the knowledge of one of them, who took a very warm interest in my success, and I believe that at first I had a very fair chance. The appointment remained for a short time in abeyance, but it was found necessary to detach Shale from O'Connell, and the appointment was therefore given to Shale. Some years after, when Shale was appointed our minister at the court of Tuscany, he asked me to give him a letter of introduction to the Grand Duke Leopold II. Of course, I treated the application as a joke, but Shale assured me that he was quite serious, and that he knew it would be of use to him. I therefore gave him a letter of introduction to a sovereign from whom both before and subsequently I have been honored by many gratifying attentions. 6. In 1849, on the promotion of Shale, the mastership of the Mint again became vacant. I thought my own claim sufficiently known to the public, but I had no political interest. My friend, Sir John Herschel, was more fortunate, and he received the appointment. 7. After a few years, the office again became vacant by the resignation of Sir John Herschel. The government had now, for the third time, an opportunity of partial repairing its former neglect. I had, however, no political party to support me, and the present master of the mint, Mr. Graham, then received the appointment. Registrar General of Births, Deaths, etc. In 1835, a new office was created, that of Register General of Births, Deaths, and Marriages. Mr. Francis Bailey and others of my friends suggested to me that, being known to the public as qualified for this situation by my previous publications, I had a fair claim to the appointment. Having made inquiries on this subject, I found that it would be useless to make any application, as the place was intended for the brother-in-law of the Secretary of State. 9. On the death of Mr. Lister, a few years after, the same office again became vacant, when other friends then made a similar suggestion. On making preliminary inquiries, I found, as before, that all applications would be useless, as the appointment was intended for a military officer, Major Graham the brother of another Secretary of State, Commissioners of Railways. 10. Some years ago, the alarm created by accidents occurring upon railways induced the government to consider about the appointment of a commission to examine into their causes and to lay down rules for the guidance of the companies in the prevention of those dangers. In 1846, an act of Parliament was passed appointing commissioners for the supervision of railways. Having myself thought much upon the subject, and having had personally some experience on railways, I had the vanity to think that the mechanical knowledge of the author of The Economy of Manufacturers would justify his appointment as one of those commissioners. Applying under such circumstances for a commissionership of the railway board, I expected that I should find few competitors with higher claims. But I had no interest. A military engineer was appointed, who already held a civil appointment and who died in less than two years after. 11. On the occurrence of this vacancy, another military officer was appointed. I was again passed over, under circumstances which at the time I thought must have caused deep regret in the mind of the minister who made the appointment. After an experience of a few years, public opinion was so strongly expressed against the Railway Commission that it was dissolved. I am satisfied that in each of these cases, the appointment was entirely due to family or political influence. I have, in the course of my experience, frequently heard of appointments made in the most flattering and unexpected manner, of titles offered, in fact, in such a way that it was impossible to decline them. Having myself seen a good deal behind the scenes of the drama of life, I have repeatedly found that those unsolicited honors have been obtained by the most persevering applicants and by the most servile flattery. Indeed, 
to the great scandal of public life, success has in some instances been obtained by a man condescending for a time to oppose his own party, and, as some observer has wittily remarked, of attempting to break into the shop for the purpose of serving behind the counter. Reflections on Patronage it cannot be doubted that patronage entrusted to the disposition of a minister often proves an onerous and ungrateful trust, demanding powers of discrimination and forbearance not always found in public men, whilst a careful observation of the manner in which patronage is usually dispensed does not lead to the conclusion that its exercise is always free from the influence of corrupt motives even in the cases in which such impure motives seem absent, it too frequently happens that other influences, besides a just and honest discrimination, appear to have taken a part in regulating the distribution of public favor. It would be invidious to speculate on the motives or discuss the merits of the appointments to which I have had occasion to refer, with their propriety or otherwise. I have individually no concern, of the positive motives which induced them I have no knowledge, at least not sufficient to justify me in condemning them on that score. But I cannot help thinking that such appointments have not always been made without some degree of pain or misgiving, and perhaps a conscientious scruple on the part of the minister. Indeed, I have sometimes indulged a suspicion that a little firmness to resist external pressure would occasionally secure more fairness to candidates for public employment and tend to retain the services of more efficient agents of the public well. The Weight of Nepotism Although mankind may differ among one another individual ad infinitum, they possess certain moral elements which are common to the race. Such belong to the animal and are never obliterated, though they may occasionally be concealed by the ermine of office, or the robe of state. Self-interest is the great lever of society, and though the patriot profess to sacrifice it for the public good, or the cynic affect to despise its influence as opposed to his philosophy, both these may claim our respect, but neither should be permitted to deceive us. A minister who professes to cast off the attributes of humanity is either a victim of delusion who has succeeded in deceiving himself, or a knave who is bent upon deceiving others. He may spurn the temptation of a bribe, because his wants do not lie in that direction, and, notwithstanding his generous pretensions, he will never discern merit unless accompanied by popular suffrage or political influence. In his balance, one gain of nepotism will weigh down all the honesty he has at his disposal. End of section 38. Recorded by Thomas Trask, near Tucson, Arizona, June 2019. Section 39. Agreeable Recollections. From Passages from the Life of a Philosopher. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. In the course of this volume, I have mentioned under other heads many agreeable circumstances, and many others remain unwritten. I shall now confine myself to two. On one occasion, when I was engaged in my workshop in arranging some machinery for experiments on a difficult part of the analytic engine, an intimate friend called, and I went into the library to see him. An unopened letter lying on the table, he asked whether I usually treat my letters in that way. I looked at the letter, which appeared to be a printed one. When my friend had left me, I opened it and found that it professed to be from the Institute of France, announcing my nomination as a corresponding member of that distinguished body. On looking at the conclusion for the well-known signature of my friend Arago, I found another name which I could not read. I therefore concluded that some wag had played me a trick. I, however, doubted whether the joke was intended to hit me or the Academy of Sciences. Having left the paper on my table, I returned to my experiments. After dinner I took up the neglected document, 
and then for the first time perceived that it professed to be from the Academy of Moral Sciences. On re-examining the signature, I found it to be that of its eminent secretary, M. Minye, and that it was an official announcement of my election as a corresponding member of that academy. Now the first impression on my mind was one of sincere regret. I felt for a moment that the academy might have thus honored me not solely for my labors in their own, but in other departments of science. This painful feeling was, however, only momentary. Then it occurred to me that I had written The Economy of Manufactures, which related to political economy, one section, and the Ninth Bridgewater Treatise, which related to philosophy, another section of the Academy of Moral Sciences. I now felt a real pleasure which amply compensated me for the transitory regret, and I am sure no member of the many academies who have honored me by enrolling my name on their list will reproach me for stating the fact that no other nomination ever gave me greater satisfaction than the one to which I have now adverted. Some years ago my eldest son, Mr. B. Herschel Babbage, was employed by the government of South Australia to explore and survey part of the northwest portion of that colony. After an absence of about six months, a considerable portion of which time he spent in a desert, he reached a small station at the head of Spencer's Gulf, intending to wait there until the arrival of a steamer from Adelaide, which was expected in about a week to carry back the wool of the distant and scattered colonists. It so happened that, a few days before, a Swedish merchant vessel commanded by Captain Orling, a part owner of the ship, had also arrived in search of a freight of wool. Captain Orling, on going ashore, heard of the arrival at the settlement of a stranger from the interior, and on inquiring found that he bore my name. He immediately went in search of my son, and having found him, said, I am not personally acquainted with your father but I am well acquainted with his name. He has shown such kindness to a countryman of mine that every Swede would be proud of an opportunity to acknowledge it. The steamer for which you are waiting cannot arrive until a week hence. There is no accommodation in this station, not even a public house. I entreat you to come on board my ship and be my guest until the steamer arrives and is ready to take you to Adelaide. It had been my good fortune to have an opportunity to render justice to the merits of Mr. Schitzer, an inventor of the Swedish difference engine. My son, who during the six previous months had slept under no canopy but that of heaven, accepted this delightful invitation, and enjoyed during the week the society of a very agreeable and highly informed gentleman. I have received many marks of attention of various kinds from the natives of Sweden. Paragraphs translated from Swedish newspapers, which were particularly interesting to me, engravings, and printed volumes. I have been honored with these attentions by persons in various classes of society, up to the highest, and I am confident that the enlightened and accomplished prince to whom I allude will not think me ungrateful when I avow that the most gratifying of all of these attentions to a father, whose name in his own country has been useless to himself and to his children, was to hear from England's antipodes of the grateful Swede, welcoming and giving hospitality on the part of his countrymen to my son for the sake of the name he bore. Conclusion I will now conclude as I began, by invoking the attention of my reader to a subject which, if he is young, may be of importance to him in afterlife he may reasonably ask what peculiarities of mind enabled me to accomplish what even the most instructed in their own sciences deemed impossible. I have always carefully watched the exercise of my own facilities, and I have also endeavored to collect from the light reflected by other minds some explanation of the question. I think one of the most important guiding principles has been this, that every moment of my waking hours has always been occupied by some train of inquiry. In far the largest number of instances the subject might be simple or even trivial, but still work of inquiry of some kind or other was always going on. 
The difficulty consists in adapting the work to the state of the body. The necessary training was difficult. Whenever at night I found myself sleepless and wished to sleep, I took a subject for examination that required little mental effort, and which also had little influence on worldly affairs by its success or failure. On the other hand, when I wanted to concentrate my whole mind upon an important subject, I studied during the day all the minor accessories, and after two o'clock in the morning I found that repose which the nuisances of the London streets only allowed from that hour until six in the morning. At first I had many sleepless nights before I could thus train myself. I believe my early perception in the immense power of signs in aiding the reasoning facility contributed much to whatever success I may have had. Probably a still more important element was the intimate conviction I possessed that the highest object a reasonable being could pursue was to endeavor to discover those laws of mind by which man's intellect passes from the known to the discovery of the unknown. This feeling was ever present to my mind, and I endeavored to trace its principles in the minds of all around me, as well as in the works of my predecessors. The end of section 39